927 Eski boy, in the place, listen. Yo, you see the bars are right in that Freeze FM started in the summer of 1999, broadcasting from West London and quickly grew to become one of the largest underground stations in the city, winning free awards for the best pirate radio station. This is the story. To late 1990s, genres such as jungle, drum and bass and UK garage saw a new generation of pirate radio stations emerging in London. Music and the scene, um, pirate radio was essential because what else did we have? There was no other way. It was raves and tape packs um, and pirate radio. I think it was a way of life. Like if you just if you look at pirate radio back then. There was no YouTube, there was no Facebook, there was no Twitter, there was no MySpace, there was no Instagram. Every area had their station, you get what I'm saying? South had theirs, East had theirs, North had theirs, but Freeze in West London, that was the radio station. Freeze FM was, was illegal and we know this, we, 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 weren't, we weren't stupid to it, we know it was an illegal pirate radio station. Freeze FM, it wasn't your average pirate radio station. It was much, much bigger than that. It was like a community, a lifestyle. Pirate radio was a lifestyle, it was life. It was, it was just a vibe, man. It was a vibe, it was something that you'll never get again. Pirate radio to me was life, really. Freeze FM, I loved it. Like, that pirate radio. Everybody was locked onto Freeze FM. In West London, there wasn't much um, grimy garage MCs when I was coming up, but in the era of pioneering West London grime. Freeze, it, it, was, it was the number one pirate radio station I was ever on. But then it came to Harrow and that was it. I'm like, okay, biggest radio station and it's in my bits. It's not an option not to go in there. Freeze really started to take control. I think it was about 2000 and 2005 when we first went on it was quite late to be fair um, and but it was then it was the biggest station in London I mean I think I think the mad thing about freeze and doing power radio at that time there were no stations that were playing up front like that they couldn't because it wasn't commercial because they wasn't playing those genres we were you know obviously it then elevated to where they took an interest in it but we made it like that everything about it was just massive to be a part of Freeze FM was probably, yeah, it's got to be the biggest pirate station I, I, I've ever known. You know, it was, it was a small station in West London. The reason why rest, um, the Freeze FM thing in West was so big is because it was moving like a Choice FM. It was moving professional, crispy. Like, remember them days, pirate radio was an aerial tinger and Freeze was just strong, bow. You know, understand? And you got MCs coming clean from East, all the corners. I was driving to come here, you know, like that. And I'm like, rah, but you lot have got everything popping in the east. I'm, I'm, I'm on my radio listening to you lot, but now you lot are coming here. So something must be good, you understand? And yeah, man, peace was popping for West, I can't lie. It did put a man on the map. The DJ and the pirate radio stations, they were the, they was the main ingredient to promote your music. Yeah, pi pirate radio to me was, you know, the highlight, the highlight of my week, as well as my bookings. This was, this, this, this was like the backbone to everything that's going on today that we do. Everything that you see when you see the music videos and you see the big shows and you see the sold out concerts and that, without pirate radio, none of that would be possible. I don't think no one really expected at all. We was just doing our thing. Everything revolved around pirate radio because back then you didn't have your YouTubes, you didn't have your Spotify, you didn't have all of these media, social sort of platforms. I joined Freeze towards the later part of it, 
around 2007. Late 2006, 2007. So I caught the end era of Freeze, but when it was definitely still at its peak. I think that private radios were integral to the birth of the garrison. Private radio meant everything to me, like Rinse FM, Freeze FM, um, they're the main ones to me. Freeze really took that title back then. You know, they were award winning, we know that, but I saw it from the ground up. Freeze put themselves in a position where, regardless of where you came from, there was a moment where you just wanted to be on that station. Even if it was to go and chat some bars or whatever, yeah, or chat some lyrics or whatever, you wanted to be on Freeze FM at one point. You wanted to say that you did it. Them days on, 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 on Freeze, Psh, never get them again, never. Them days where you're just, you're spitting your heart out one minute and then next minute, ah, oh, it's gone off lads. I used to work around radio, like I used to base my life around radio. I used to think, right, radio's coming up. I've got to work around that, I've got to be there, I've got to do it. So for me, with Freeze FM, and how, because Freeze FM started my career as a DJ, really. For every time you turned 927 on, you couldn't turn it off. It was, it was just a station you had to listen to. Anywhere in London, 927. But Freeze was, Freeze was um, at the heart of pirate radio of West London and North West London. Like no one was chatting to Freeze. Kind of, we were the biggest anyway, Freeze was the biggest. I went to school with a guy called Adam Freeze. Adam Freeze was the co-founder of Freeze FM. So, when Freeze first started, I was putting on uh, like garage parties in like Uxbridge and Harrow and Rainers Lane. And I knew Hyper Ian Gusto and Gusto introduced me to Adam and he was like, I'm starting up a new station. It all started right locally and uh, that's when everyone started jumping on board. Because it was like, what's this? This is a vibe. We had a lot of people that weren't just going to be one of they didn't just want to come and take part in the scene, they wanted to really take control of it. And I was like, all right, so I thought I'd tune in for a couple of things. And then I started hearing some of the names of the guys that I used to sort of knock about, like hyper -E, Gusto, obviously Ashley J was on it. Me and Adam um, built one of the first studios and like everyone sort of helped in, you know, everyone, someone come and built the studio and someone done the electric, someone obviously painted it and got it done. It was all just in the beginning. Yeah, it weren't about the money in the beginning. It was about, well, it was still about the love later on, but at the beginning there was no money involved in it. There was no dough. Uh, it was just about your passion, pure passion for music and love for like the scene, which at the time was Garage. Guys, the original management team, we've got Adam and Neil, they, they were friends of mine that used to come in my record shop, D Vinyl in uh, Harrow and Uxbridge and Watford as well, forgetting that one. Um, they used to come in the shop, buy records, I was good friends with them. And they approached me about first DJing on there. I'd done a, a few guest shows, I think. Um, and, but as I said, I was still on flex at the time. And then they said, do you want to come in and be part of the management team? Uh, which I did, because I could see the station had potential. Freeze was going to start. This gave West London MCs and DJs a whole new opportunity because now we've got the popping fucking radio station in our end. Bro, if you want to come down here, you got to see us. So this is this is this is what it became, and that was good for us because that that just made us blow up. Now I got a couple of phone calls, and Freeze was like, "Yeah, you up for it?" I said, "Yeah, let's do it." I just went, and then uh, I heard about Freeze. Freeze came about, and at the time, Pleasure was running it. So I spoke to Pleasure, and then um, he said, "Yeah, we've got a Saturday morning, eight till 10. I wanted to go in there. Chucky um, vouched for me, and before that, oh, my name was NJ Fever, yeah, Naughty Jack Fever. So, like, how I joined Freeze was, like, through NJ Fever. I got on that station with a guy called DJ Oscar, yeah? I got invited to be a guest on Freeze by Graham J. And so I, I went there and I <laughs> did a show. And then it was like, yeah, this is a nice little vibe here. This is, they've got a little setup here, so all right. And then that was it, we just jumped on Freeze. Yeah, Bulldog got me a slot there, well, I think it was on a Thursday night. Freeze FM came along, what, 99? 99, yeah. So I must have been, I must have jumped on Freeze early doors. I'd say around sort of 2001. Yeah, my first set was on a station called Juice FM in South Kilburn. When I first went on Pirate Radio, it was my local community radio station, and that was like Juice FM, literally on my estate. And, um, 
When I finished that set and walked on the street, people from my local estates were bigging me up. So I got a buzz for it from there. And I'm like, you know, to me, I was a celebrity in my ends. And then it was, that was it. It was just, I fell in love with it from there, man. It was me. I was like, I want to spit. I want to get to the top of this shit. I want to, I want to get to number one, obviously. Made that tune. Do you really like it? And then it kind of just blew from there. Um, but I always had a love for Pirate Radio. Even though we was massive, went number one, whatever, did what we did. Pirate Radio was so serious to us back then. We, we were in the charts, done Top of the Pops, and the same day we went back to Pirate Radio. Do you understand how real that is? I wasn't finished with radio. Do you get me? I used to love it. I used to just love that vibe. Great times. Shows with man like Spinny B, Catty, Double O, Sharky. Yeah, so I was on with Black Ops. I used to DJ for Black Ops, Johnny Cash and their crew. And um, we were on, uh, I think that was the earlier stages, like the 2001, 2002. So I formed the Black Ops, where I got Charmsy, West London producer, Bad Boy Charmsy, Dreddy, you know I mean, Bad Boy producer, Too Real. And, um, and then I had a, a few artists, Capone, a Sly Boogie. Being on radio with Sharky P, I listened to him a lot. And Sparks was like, like rest in peace, massive legend. My first ever show on Freeze FM, was um, the show was six to late if I can remember that was after Sharky and Spinny so I met Sharky and Spinny for the first ever time and that and then I, when I say I was nervous I was nervous my later on shows were with like Sharky P um, we done our show on a Sunday so I had an organization that, that's where the Black Ops were formed and why I call it Black Ops is where I watched the JFK movie and I said well anything that's done in the underground I can't be controlled, it's called the Black Ops. So that's why I said, you know what, I like that name, that's what I stand for. I'm the Black Ops of the, I'm the, Black Ops of the music scene. You know, I'll be listening to, like, Roll Deep, Shine It Down. At the time, I was um, in a crew called SLK. It was cool, because Freeze was predominantly garage, really, and like R&B and grime and that, so. Yeah, London Zoo as a collective, but um, we kind of brought something different. I had the drum and bass thing. Sharky, Nasty Jack, Chucky, like Wiley, Special Delivery, like Nasty Crew, who like everyone was on the station, so I knew this is where I needed to be. Pirate Radio was like everything. At that time, a lot of the mainstream or national stations weren't catering for the music, grime and the underground garage and all the MCs, so. Freeze was just the best by miles. Like there was no other station that would like be able to be on as much or have the same DJs that have the same vibe and yeah, it was just, that was, especially in West, that was like the main one that really, really pushed anything. And to be honest, probably in the whole of London really, that was probably about as close as you could get to like a legitimate radio station. You had to be special fam. You had to be special because there was no social media. There was nothing like that. What you had to do is be lit. What I'd always say about Freeze, everything, everything was, was done well. Yeah. And I rated Gusto, Hyper -E. Um, Fatal Attraction, and I used to hear them and, on 90.4 and be like, yeah, I need to be in on this radio shit. Big up Fatal Attraction. Fatal Attraction in Norfolk. I was a part of a crew called Fatal Attraction, and um, it was me, my cousin, Cheeky, my brethren from school, Carty, and um, our DJ, Marky, and Marky was friends with my cousin Cheeky, and we were super young at the time. Um, but like, the, obviously the one thing that we had in common was like we all was just into music and shit like that. Kind of, we realised, obviously we, we kind of both had a mutual vibe for music, me, Chucks um, and L. And then kind of, Elliot was, Mark was coming to the crew because he was Elliot's brethren. And then we linked up with Mark from that. And then Mark showed, Mark had a mad selection. Like if there was ever a DJ with a mad selection of vinyl, yeah, it was Mark. And to know, say that he could mix those, those tracks proper, he had to be in the crew, so it was it was organic. It all it all came together like like a jigsaw puzzle. It, like what Kai said though, it was more organic. You know, like it's more like come to my house. I've, yeah, I've got some decks in there. So. The first set as a group, we was kids. I remember like Neil T and Adam, and um, yeah, we just, they just sort of heard that there was this new station going. I think it had literally only been on a couple of weeks, and it was on a, in a shed in Greenford. <laughs> yeah, so being on Freeze from the start, you know, I, I think I got to see all four studios. There was the 1999 
the Greenford shed. Yeah, it was a shed or garage, one of the two in Greenford. Which I don't think we were at for long. What was it, 2001, maybe 2000? I moved to South Harrow. Um, <laughs> got good memories of that place. And then there was the two in Rainers Lane. The location of the studio was Rainers Lane. The free studio in Rainers Lane, that, that was, I think that the best time for me for Freeze is when it was in the basement of the shop. Rainers Lane, I remember that one. Then they moved across the road, behind the building. And there was, um, you had to go up through the stairs, then round down the, the, the mad staircase, come through the black door at the back. That was political and there was always puddles there or you could drive all the way around and get in there, driving. You'd have Rick and Ingrid and mix it up upstairs in the office. And I remember you go into like, you go through the door, the office is on the left hand side, but then you go down the stairs and then the radio station is in the room. Um, it was in a back room, tiny, the, where the decks was a tiny back room. It was so hidden away, it, it, was, it was good. It was right at the back of the, of the little room. And then walk around and come around and flip in. And then you go down the stairs, on the right hand side is the radio station. And actually on the left hand side was um, Double D Experience's studio. I can remember um, record shops. I can remember a fruit machine. I quite used to like the look of as well. Remember the old school fruit machine? And there was a garage out the back as well. Some sort of a garage that'd be underneath. Um, but underneath we had a, a mechanic and uh, I think his name was Alan and he was going mad. If the music was loud, he'd be banging up, turn that music, crap music off. The first time I got into Freeze was when I was in Rainers Lane. Um, I was above a shop selling trainers, I think. I'd done a couple of guest slots just to promote Best of British. So we were first at the one with the fire escape, which we shared with Vibe, which was awesome because you'd get crossing in with other, other DJs and, you know, I met quite a few DJs. Sam Devine was down there on Vibe one day. Um, you know, you'd, you'd meet people, it'd be a nice little hub. I remember going there to do, fa uh, do guest shows because Flex had stopped, so I stopped doing my four till six on Sunday and I was just literally looking for that platform again. But because I spent like six, seven years of my life doing a Sunday four till six, I knew that I wanted to do a Sunday set. My whole, I, I moved my whole life around to do my pirate radio show set. And Freeze was always there as like one of the really big stations and they had loads of special guests and they were quite kind of open in terms of what they were playing. So Pirate was like the way to get your music out there. The pirate radio in me is why I do what I do. I'm not going to lie. It's not because of money or Heatwave or Rolex. It's because of the pirate radio discipline and collective records. Like, if you wanted to hear music, you'd have to know what pirate radio... If you wanted to hear exclusive music, underground music, music that was hard to find, music that was cool, the, the new sounds, you know, you had to listen to pirate radio. And then Freeze, freeze the Fem come like down the line. I was doing raves and that. I was doing raves, I was getting about garage wise and stuff. And then Freeze FM come on and I loved Freeze because it was like the perfect blend of like, because we, we loved old school garage, but we also loved the new thing because we was about spitting and, and doing our thing, but still about the vibe. So when Freeze FM come along, it was like the perfect blend. So you got the old school garage going into the, the more upbeat, not upbeat, but more harder garage and going over into grime sort of thing. So as an MC, you're gassed, you're, you're getting your time to just spit your shit, you see what I'm saying, do your thing. Literally, when you think to yourself, back in the day, stations like Freeze the Femme, how far it transmitted. The tower we were transmitting from was the Swiss Cottage Towers, and a lot of people came off them towers back in the day, Kiss FM, Passion FM, all the big stations that were booming came off them towers and even when we came off them towers people were calling us up from brighton texting us saying we're picking you up on the hill in brighton i was like yeah okay but because we were we were pushing three to four hundred watts at one time and if you're so high you're going to get out you're going to reach to land you'd never think you'd get to with freezer fem i mean the reach of freezer fem was absolutely huge we were hitting what felt like every corner of london i was getting listeners from Watford, I was getting listeners from Epin Forest, I was getting listeners from Kent, from Elephant and Castle, all over the place, all over the place. The, the reach of Freeze FM was absolutely huge. It felt like the whole of London was listening to you. To be an MC back then, you had to get inside and put away, put away, can see. You see that stupid voice I just did, yeah? I believed I 
100% generally believe that you had to do that to be an MC. And all the MCs that didn't do that, yeah, they was rubbish to me, fam. If you was an MC back in the day, um, Grimes popping, boom, boom, boom. There was a few ways that you would, it was a few ways people would hear about you. So the first way would obviously be pirate radio. So you'd go and freeze the film, you'd do what you're doing, your name starts to get about. And I remember the first day we went out, it weren't the first day we was on set, we, we went down, I think it was like an interview process we went through. We met Elski. Elski was the go-to guy, and Elski used to come in and he was like the technical guy and he used to just say, yeah, yeah, Elski, come through, come through. Deck number two's not working or whatnot. Elski took us over to the studio. I'm sure we even had to sign something, like. I used to remember that bag on the shoulder. I used to bring the record bag to work. So I knew, right, I've got to be at uh, Freeze that evening. So I'm going to work, bringing a record bag, doing my work. They're like, what have you got your bag for, mate? It weren't, it was two bags, actually. It weren't even one, it was two. I wouldn't, I wouldn't arrange things on certain days that I knew my shows were on. It's like, no, I've got radio. That's that. It's as simple as that. We would literally, uh, myself and John, close the shop, jump straight in the car and we're gone. Straight down, you know. I, I was lucky because I had the record shops. I got them in promoters and I was fairly established before I even started on Pirates. I met him in Divinal, in um, Divinal Records in Uxbridge. The vinyl records was really like influential to me also because not only am I trying to write lyrics and then listen to uh, radio, I'm also going to buy records and meeting Adrian Atom, John Manning, um, them kind of guys. And them lot are on the tape packs that I'm buying. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm buying the tape packs and they've got their own double-sided tape. You know what I mean? Like, no, I, I, I remember coming home and just, my radio was crackling. And I was tuning in just to hear, just to hear the newest garage. It was so solid, all them doing killing it. You hear like you hear live raves on going through the airwaves. Oh, we used to come out raves on weekends and then go straight in the car for free to film. That was it. On the way home, free to film. Yeah, yeah. Always, always, yeah. If, I, if I didn't yeah. go, if they boys didn't go, yeah. um, I didn't go raving, or I went raving, either yeah. I was we didn't yeah. cover the show. Yeah. Like we was on radio when we were still in school and that. So that was a cool thing, like obviously not many people was doing that at the time, innit? You needed to be involved. If you was an MC or a DJ and you weren't on pirate radio, you weren't on stations like Freeze or Ice, or any of the big names for West, you were messing around. Freeze had the same stature as Deja. And for me, I just knew they would have different listeners and have their foundation listeners. Back then, you just had people from everywhere that were locking and it was very loyal. You had a loyal following. Back then, people would actively look for radio stations. True. Yeah, people would get in the car, scan through, look for a radio station to listen to. Then once they found one they liked, you've got a, a listener. Yeah. And until they find another one or you get taken off, you, listeners are quite loyal to radio stations as well. We used to get the same listeners all the time. I know on a lot of my shows. Back then you didn't have YouTube, internet, Facebook, all that sort of stuff. So obviously Freeze, all other pirate radio stations at the time, that was the best way to get the word about. Back then, it was massive. Everyone, everyone was hungry for it then, to play on radio. Back then, you'd have to be on a prime time. So people wanted to be on um, the six to eights, mainly. I remember people wanted the six to eights. Everyone wanted to be on freeze. Everyone's listening. Radio, it was not like, see like today, you want to go YouTube or TV. That wasn't even a goal for me. Radio was the thing, like, if I'm on radio, I'm the guy, so. Everyone was listening to Freeze. Well, it felt like everyone was listening to Freeze. Even my nan, she used to listen. She was like, probably like my second biggest fan. It was radio. And if you ask someone, some of the younger generation now about radio, yeah, we used to go out and spit it out. They'd be like, radio, what's that? Like, it's prehistoric. But um, that's what it was. The promotion was on radio. There was no social media, there was no YouTube. You just had to go on radio and spit your heart out and mix the best set and consistently do that week yeah, on wow. week on week. Mm. Um, and then you'll build up your fan base and you always have the regular people calling. And like we had, I'm not gonna lie, Fatal Attraction had the streets on lock. I'm not even gonna lie to you. Like we had people ringing from North, East, West, <laughs> South. That is the truth, isn't it? It was everything. It was like playing to an invisible crowd. You had all of that where it's today's market streaming. People listen back. It's not as now. You know, everyone wants things on demand, listen to it when they want. With Pirate Radio, you had to be there in the moment. We didn't have YouTube or social media like we have today. And that was that was our social media of those days. It was uh, Pirate Radio. If you wanted to know what was going on, if you wanted to know what rave was gonna be hot that weekend, you would listen like 
to what the MC at the time was saying or whatever they were promoting. And I remember being in the studio and they had all of the flyers up of the different raves that were happening. And then you'd like, yeah, this event is happening on such and such date. Make sure you'll be there, get your tickets. If you want more information, call the studio number. And it was just like, that's how you found out what was hot from, you know, what was not. If you're of a certain age, you don't really know about um, or you don't know kind of life without social media and how easy it is to contact people, message them, see what people are doing, consume music. Um, that's like amazing. Before social media, things were very, very different. So um, the phone line, the mobile phone number that people text or call in was a good indicator of who was listening and whether people liked what you did or they hated it. Um, adverts, advertising like the raves that were going on were really important as like an offshoot of that you had like flyer packs and magazines and people coming out of a rave would be given flyers to like the next rave because websites and online forums like stay locked and uptown were kind of were like the early online kind of communities um but that was still not as widespread as like you know instagram or whatever that was the way of getting into uh, trying to get bookings with promoters at the start, when I first started on Pirate Radio, I never used to get bookings in clubs because I was too young. Promoters never took me serious. Never once took me seriously. They was like, nah, you're too young, too young, too young. It wasn't until I was 18, 19 and on Ice FM, and I'd been on Ice FM for a good two years, or whatever, or a year and a half, or whatever, um, that promoters started taking me seriously because on the radio, I would start promoting their raves for them. So they'd phone up and say, oh yeah, can you shout out my rave for me? Da -da 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 -da. Oh yeah, yeah, cool, all right, cool. Give me a booking now. And um and then yeah, literally from then that was how I got my first residency at a club. Like literally from doing Freezer Fam. So I had Majestic, which is probably one of the biggest artists going now. He came up a few times. Very good like entertainer man. Like probably one of the best sets I've done with him on there. RB come up a few times. MC R B. Obviously you know him from Try Me Out and Anthem. Like Spinny B, Spinny B's getting there now. Because I started off like on the under 18 circuit, you know, and then going through them kind of motions, I got on a couple of uh, over 18s. So um, it was actually through Martin Lana uh, who got me on Liberty at, at Coliseum. And I remember sitting in my mate's house, and, and like I said, the ads were every two hours. So you're waiting for the advert, you're waiting to hear it. And I thought I heard my name, but obviously Spinny B, you're like. He is the, like one of the kings of pirate radio. He has been on Pirate Radio for as long as I can remember. From he, I, He'll tell you himself, but probably from when he was like 14 years old. But this was more about, the, the thing that got shared around the most in those days were tapes. Do you know what I mean? That was the thing that was getting shared around a lot. Not pictures of people, there was no Instagram, there was no nothing. It was like, have you got the tape of this? Have you got the tape of that? Are you going to this under you know, Are you going to that? And... But, um, that, that's when I realised the power of, of Pirate Radio. I was like, wow, like the phone just pinging off. So then, I um, can't remember what my first set times were, but I ended up doing um, seven till nine every Friday, basically opened it up. And I was I, I was on there for a good, I'd say two, good two or three years. That like, you know, we all met each other through Pirates and then obviously the under 18 raves and so on, but a lot of the radio stations, the Pirates, did the lineups for those raves. It was their MCs and DJs that were playing at these places, so. Um, obviously, knowing it's illegal and pirate, I guess I was kind of a bit prang. Promotion-wise, the radio is where it happened. If you wanted a new tune out there, you got it on the radio. The promotion side of it was, 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 was fun. It was hard, it was hard, it was hard graft. Being on the flyer, being in the rave, being on the radio. The only other thing that could help you other than that was somehow getting on the mic or the decks so you could feature on the tape pack. That was it. Like, pirate radio was the only way, or unless you was dedicated, you stood outside the raves, or you went to record shops to get the flyers. A lot of people used to do that, though. I remember, like, a lot of people used to just have flyers. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, wallpaper. So you've got to understand, without Pirate Radio, for, for, for music, for selling music, for promotions, for everything, don't you remember? You'd have like 30 adverts on Freeze for raves. You know, they were making money from that advertising. So I remember, you got to the stage where your show could be six till eight, adverts were going to be on for half an hour certain times, and you'd be there pissed, but 
it was just like you, you knew what was going on. It was it was the hub to understand everything that was going on. So yeah, it used to be like that. Even um even on the radio, in between sets on every hour, we'd have to put on the adverts. You have to put on the adverts. You got to put them on. So sometimes you, you you're halfway through your set, you got to stop the set, put on the adverts, and then all the adverts for the raves coming up used to play. Christmas, I think, was the biggest time for adverts. You go like so you. you, you your radio set was two hours. So you get there, yeah, right. I'm doing six to eight tonight, right. Get there at six, adverts are on. Right, yeah, 10 past six. Right, have another advert going, yeah, yeah, right. 20 past six, right, I'm ready to go. And because the station is popping and everyone wants to put their adverts on, you could be waiting 10, 15. Half past six, adverts has finished. So the adverts have been into your show half an hour. You've got an hour and a half. Yeah, what I loved about Pirate was they always had a rave. Like there was always a specific rave associated with um, like a radio station. And I still remember Freezer Film, it was the first garage station to go 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which was unheard of. And at the time, well, if I'm talking 97 to 2000, Radio stations running at weekends. You start on Friday at seven, seven o'clock on a Friday night and you finish midnight or two, eight, two, two a.m. on a Sunday. It was the first radio station which gave a platform to all the early MCs and the early crews to allow them to, to do, them, do their thing when no other radio station was giving those guys a chance to do that. And uh, as an MC, you got to build yourself up like because all the ice boys I was with, all Danger K, all them lot anyway. But, and you have to understand that was the training ground. As an MC or a DJ, like on radio, that was the training ground. That's where you honed in your skills. It was like sparring. If you train, if you box, if you play football, you go on the pitch, you, you play, you train. That's what pirate radio was. It wasn't just that. You learn new music, you learn new things. It's where you get experience. I don't look at it as competition, I do what I do, but back then it was like you had to be heard. You know, you could go to a pirate radio show and there's 20 MCs there waiting. So, you know, only the strong survive. You had to, you, you, you couldn't just be an average MC. You wanted to be that guy, basically. And I was confident and loud, but it was like World War Three to get to the mic. At that time in life, yeah, when you're that age as well, things just happen and you don't really think too much about it. Someone just says to you, oh yeah, like, so and so, there's like such and such of a radio station, or we're linking up at so and so's yard, and we would just go there. So like, I might even end up at Nikki and Nike's yard one day, or I might be at Flirt of D's house somehow, or I might be at like a young Deneo's house or some shit. I don't know how we're there, I don't know how it's, you know what I mean? All I know is there's a bunch of MCs and we're just in these facilities just doing whatever it is that we're doing. Pirate Radio to us, well to me anyway, before before we started, it was my education into the garage scene. Yeah. It was it was where I would hear all the new music. Um, Cause you couldn't hear that on, on, on the mainstream stations. And I really enjoyed it. Like I really, it was, you. I just liked being out, listen, people listened to me. Like when I was, I could never, in a club, I can't get on the mic, but when I got into the radio, there was no one there, and it was just me, and that was it, a zone. I was in a zone, and I was, it just took over, and I, was, I used to hype it up, and I used to enjoy it. You know, it was really good. In those days, pirate radio was the only platform that you could use to get heard. The setup sometimes, you come in, stuff wouldn't be working. It would be a shithole, the room that the deck was in. Yeah, it'd be butts, and just mess everywhere. That was standard for most stations, you know. I expected it to be some top-notch, unbelievable studio. I'm over in East London, I can hear freeze. I'm in North London, I can hear freeze. I was on the motorway, I can hear freeze. I get there and there's just these two turntables that look like they've absolutely had it. When I got there, it was still vinyl. Vinyl was very much still the thing. So like the CDJs was like very basic. You might have just one, I remember in freeze, there was this, um, they had that, it was like, I think it was like the CDJ like 100 or something. It was just like a box, it was one block, a mini block, square thing with a dial. 
Yeah, I remember uh, one of my one of my funny memories is trying to mix on CDJs for the first time at Freeze. They were like the CDJ 100s, I think. Get the old CDJs that were. Oh, the little the brick, the brick. The little dial, the little tiny dial. I remember that. The youngsters today, they won't know about this, but there'll be times when I come to the radio station and someone's nicked the mic or something's gone wrong with the mic because someone's been going too crazy. And we have to go and plug in the we have to go and plug in the headphones into the microphone jack, and boom, off you go. There, there were sets I'd done where I was spitting into a headphone, like one headphone, not even with the thing that goes over your head. Literally one headphone just barring out. You like that? We're trying to queue up a record, and the whole unit was going backwards and forwards, and uh, obviously the crossfader. You never touch a crossfader on a <laughs> on a pirate radio station. You're lucky if the up and downs work. You had your two turntables. You had a mixer, which was battered man it was like everything was faded like all the decks was all like i used to bring my own uh, needles i used to bring my own mic the mic i tell you you don't want to touch it it was you, i smelt mics once man it was like like that <laughs> the neck the person that the mic used to smell of like somebody's breath from before so you always had to hold it and a microphone i mean the microphone that you the smell of it was vile. That mic, I hated it. That mic was full of germs. Germs, it was, yeah. it was infested. When I mean the mic was hot and wet by the time we <laughs> came <laughs> on. <laughs> the, 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 the mic was, when you got the mic, when you got the mic after a set like that, it was like, yeah, this is, this has been rinsed. Any MC will remember this. You hold the mic like this and then you get the thing, you gotta hold the wire and bend it because it keeps cutting out. The mic, more time, bruv, you'd have to hold the wire up, right? To get it sounding right, put some tape around it. The, the only thing, you always had a penny on top of the needle and the needle was half worn out in general. Every station, you would never find Concord in any station. And if they were, it was the last DJs and then they probably got stolen. The rules of the radio were no swearing, no drinking, no smoking and pay your subs. If you didn't pay your subs, that was it. Done, you're done. I never used to pay subs. And my deal was, when they go to do the, the roof, or they had a bit of any issues, call Marcus. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> when Ricky kind of took over Freeze FM from, from Adam, I think Adam was still involved, but you know, Ricky, Ricky kind of took over a bit more. I would definitely say he brought a lot of structure. With all of that, it was like, it was structured a certain way. If I remember rightly, you had like a lot of the grime guys and stuff were quite late in the day. Garage was more during the day. R&B and stuff was during the day. And then I used to have, um, I remember I had like a slow jam show in the morning. And I even remember like my son being born and I was on my way to radio and my missus ring me. She's like, oh, I've just gone into labor. And I was like, <laughs> can, you not, can you not hold on a little bit? Because I've got to do my radio show. It's only going to be two hours, I'll be back. Oh, oh boy. Yes! Yep. <laughs> I've been picking him up for the show, innit? I was bigging him up, my unborn baby. <laughs> it was patient. Yeah, it was Listen, it was a commitment. Yeah, epic times. And if we move on a bit with Freeze, when kind of grime was grime and garage was garage and R&B was, you know, the sets were very locked and, and you'll probably be able to see online some. If you look to that lineup from a Monday morning right away through to the following Sunday night, there were some crazy shows throughout. And I'm talking, we're talking Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, every set was booked up with a regular MC or DJ. By then, everything had changed and Garage, I think, was a peak. Like, grime started to really become a thing and then and then Dizzy ended up getting signed and then I think that that was the moment when people started to realise that rah, we, there's, something, there's something in it here. From there, that was where all these MCs were born, do you know what I mean, in Garage. And then Grime kind of went that way because producers started producing for these men. Do you know what I'm saying? The Wileys, they started producing for the, 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 um, the, the, the Maxwell Ds, um, for, for man like Major Ace and all them man. So Grime was born through, through over East. Our generation was the Grime kids. So we were, we, we was listening to Garage and we would go to Garage dances as youngsters. We'd go there um, and party and enjoy ourselves. But as artists, as MCs and whatever, 
we were the grand kids so we it's almost like we were we were listening to garage but we wasn't as involved in garage we were we started with Graham. when garage transformed into grime it happened on freeze fm for me the r and and hip hop came in and at the same time grime was coming in i love grime i like it it was a vibe it was an energy uh it was a bit aggy at times but that's that's the way it was it was like rock and roll it was like the punk era they had to scream and shout to get heard so with garage yeah there were moments like in garage where there was like the occasional tune that you really wanted to MC over. I am one of the culprits that many people see. Oh, you messed up Gary, Johnny, man. This is that, that, that free enough times. You, yeah, you, man, you messed it, blah, you dogged it out, blah. I had my own friends who was in the garage. Man, you dogged it out, but you, you're the one who corrupted the garage. I said, no, no, no. I knew the future was coming. The old school heads, they're stagnant, man. They're called old school because they're old. They don't make nothing new. It was like Dizzy Rascal, Wiley, that sort of stuff, I was playing in my set. Eskimo, obviously. You start playing like musical mob and all that and the phones just bang, bang, bang. And I said, damn, I said, I like this kind of garage, just the dark stuff. So I said, I'm gonna make come with a new formula. I'm gonna fuse the, the garage bass line with the hip hop beats, yeah? So that's why I've got the sublow sound. The bass is from the garage, the sublow from the garage. And Freeze was a big part of the transition. 2002, 2003, when you like had like musical mob. I was working in um, Black Market at that time. 2002, I was working in Black Market, and you had like Pulse X, Ends. It was funny because there was a one day that they said to me, "Oh, I want to play you this." I was literally leaving, yeah, and they said, "Let me play you this tune." So they played me this tune, bong bong, the musical mob thing, and I was like, "I just, I literally done." It's a bit the same, isn't it? It just goes the same all the way through. And they were like, nah, bruv, you have to listen. This is the thing. I was like, it's sick, but it's just the same. You know, like that. Yeah. I didn't know. <laughs> Bro, I have never, in this country, anywhere around the world that I've been, Lagos lost their mind over Musical Mob. Oh, wow. Bro, I watched 10,000, nah, 20,000 people lose their shit blood. Oh, okay. Bum, so they went, they went Iron Upper. This was the, the year before. And the Heartless Tree that got behind it and all of that in it. And they, it was, it was mashing out, out Iron Upper out there. So um, they've come back now and I've already, I'm already like, oh my God, I've already heard in it. So by the time they come back, they're like, I'm like, bro, yeah, you were, you're not right. <laughs> that tune, that tune's doing bits, isn't it? When I'm done a little bit of like, went into musical mob, I see a sea of people go, there was about five reloads. They went crazy. The era of Freezer Femme was that it helped to really launch the grime era, the grime that is still going strong today. The birth of fucking grime, I was there, I ain't gonna lie. I think Freeze is, um, uh, Freeze was, was was hugely important with the, um, the grimier sort of like the, yeah, probably the grime scene, not even the grimier sound, the grime scene, um, because you'd have, you'd have musical mob and special delivery and, Special Delivery, they actually the first people that I heard do um, the live shouts, like they, whatever it was. Special Delivery just fawns, man. We jumped on Freeze FM. That was really the birth, no? Yeah, it was. Uh, and then, so in, in those days, you had a few, super, you had like Super Crews, and there wasn't really that many. So we, we, we counted on our finger that you had, obviously, a Pejgo, and, and, and then Pejgo spin offs. That, actually, Pejgo probably made pretty much all the Super Crews. Yeah. But when you think about it, if you, We've got pay as you go, then you see Wiley, he goes off to Roll Deep. Yeah. Um, Ace, he goes he, he goes off and does East Connection first, but then he comes he has his own crew which is special delivery. I'm so solid with like producing like a couple of instrumentals that were like more tailored, that were more darker and tailored towards people who had bars and like wanted to spit a not a, a, a eight bar, because that was what most MCs had at the time. This was, you know, they had instrumentals where you wanted to drop a 64 bar. You had MCs like Hyperactive. You know, Freeze, when you're talking about grime and, and the growth of grime, they were all about the clashing at the start. And I love that. Like, I love that whole sportsmanship of the clashing. That was how it, that's how you got your name out. For a long period of time, MCs would come out and it was all about your borough, your manor where you're from, you're, you know, you got a problem with me, then you got a problem with my whole, the whole crew, my whole team. So yeah, all the, all the, all the crews was really East London. Everything that was kind of popping, all the, 
the main raves and all that, they was all East London crews. There was um, obviously West London North West was doing their thing, they was going on, but pay as you go. They were like the first grime MCs because they were talking badness on the on the mic. Whereas garage MCs, it was more fun. Um, it was more about girls and, and partying and having a good time. Whereas the 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 so solids and that they were more talking wickedness and stuff that we used to speak about in grime. Yeah, when we got to freeze, we was like Snipe said, we was the first from like East or one of the super crews to come out to be bumped. Freeze FM, that is special delivery. And kind of from there, people kind of followed a little bit. So enough people came to our sets. Obviously these times we're like, we all grew up together. We're, we're rolling with like Roll Deep all the time. I used to hang around with Danny Weed from school. Like um, we've got like same family and all that. So I used to hang around with Danny Weed, Don P, all like us, all that. I was around there, all Wiley, all them lot. Um, with Pay As You Go and stuff that they came in with a certain type of sound. And then you could start seeing that there was a change that was happening. Not just, not, not just, um, musically but there was a shift in like what kids were gravitating to and what they were starting to like and you know on one hand you would have like some of the die-hard ravers would be more on the style of like the heartless crew way of doing things but then like there was some young kids that were like really on the so solid bar in and they liked the, how certain men looked and all of these type of things or whatnot, yeah. So they were like the first, I'd say they were like, even though people call So Solid Garage, I feel, I feel like they were the first grime act. And then we followed stuff like that. So our whole generation followed off the back of So Solid being the first big kind of like people where we're from, Cancer the States and that being on the Brits or being on TV and music videos and blah, blah, blah. A lot of DJs who play different instrumentals for MCs to spit on, they are part of that, basically. Um, DJ Slimzy, Paco, Play Galero, uh, Major Ace. Yeah, there was a trend, they was in that transition. You're getting these ones that are just instrumentals, but instrumentals that slap. So you're like, yeah, you know what? I can really go in on this and I can say something rather than just on the in-between you know what I mean? Getting a little something, something, trying to keep them hype, drop a little knowledge or a little lyrics. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? A little punchline here and there where they're like, hey man's got some bars, but then still being able to hold the crowd. It sort of progressed a little bit from there, it got darker. So I was pushing Grime from, man, Grime was like, Garage to me was too like. Uh, yeah, I was diehard Garage and I, and I just couldn't stand all the, the attitude and the violence and just, just the raves changed, it wasn't the same. The vibe started to change. In the, in, in the raving scene, the vibe started to change. You go to a garage rave, you were vibing, you were good, you were smiling. Yeah. But then you go to a grand rave, that, that vibe started to change. <laughs> yeah, that energy, Not too many men were smiling as much. It went from champagne and friendly kind of vibes, that was garage, and then grime, like Eskimo dance. When we used to go um, area to do Eskimo dance, yeah? Grime was, it, it was different then, like it was a lot more raw. When grime come in, the beats were darker, the bass lines were darker, the whole vibe was a lot more gritty. And I think that was really part of the thing that made it um, made it aggressive as well. That's how Grime was born, bro. Like for me, Grime was born on council estates and youth centres and broadcasted through pirate radio through London. Like that was the voice of the streets. Well, at that point, it wasn't even Grime yet. It mm. was just certain tracks. It was like a transition. Like Garage and Grime kind of came together. There was resistance from Garage to let Grime in. So then Grime kind of did their own thing, you know, Wiley kind of epitomised it with what do you call it? Yeah, it's like, all right. That's when it started to change in terms of like, MC started taking over and they wanted like instrumentals and, and those sort of beats to ride. And then it just slowly just turned into like a whole scene, mainly like pole sex, yeah. That was the one that really sort of stuck out for me, yeah. Wookie, Wookie, Zed Bias, LB, they were, to me, their sound was just like, there, there was nothing touched it. And Steve Gurley, I would base whole sets around like four or five producers and, and make it work. Then Zinc come in, you throw a few Zincs in at the same time. And it was about 2004 that it got too dark. Um, it was sort of like a breakbeat-y kind of era. Zinc and crew were making a lot of really, really big tunes at the time. And it was a nice sort of transition period. Obviously I loved Grime uh, when Grime got to where it got to, 
Um, obviously being a mob DJ, I was fully into it. It just happened with tunes like Agent X, Decoy, Sticky Triplets. There was a few Wookiee crossover tracks. And then it just started to develop into a more of a darker sound. Um, we got more MC based and then it just sort of tr transitioned naturally. So what the music people were making, they were copying off of people that were just making it. So if a track, Pulse X for example, Dilemma by So Solid, nothing tracks, like no, no, no like source, like no substance, no, no one sat in a studio and like mixed it down on the desk and everything like that. Brian, I just thought, this ain't for me, man. I just thought, I can't keep up with this. It's like, it's a different genre. I'm from Garage. Garage ain't grime. There was becoming a period there yeah, where like certain tunes would drop and that was where you would just drop your lyrics or whatever and do your thing or whatnot. And I remember one, one, one um, tune that doesn't get talked about a lot, yeah, when we're talking about the transitioning of moving in towards grime was um, Melody, Master Steps. Yeah, when you hear that and then the way that it drops, that was like, if you had some bars, that was a dream of an instrumental, yeah? Because as soon as that drops, do, 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 you wanted to drop your bar on that, yeah? You know, free, Freeze was, Freeze really saw through generations of MCs and stuff that went on to make big careers, you know, Wiley, Kano. Me, Kano, um, D-Double. Like I had Kano on there, I had Tinchy Strider, I even had Ja Rule come on there. There was like J JME, I remember him listening in once, but I know he was on Freeze. Um, Skepta, Wiley, I don't know if Dizzy touched down, I think Dizzy might have touched down on Freeze, I'm not sure. Seeing so, you know, obviously Flo would go Shell, Van Damme would go Shell, Suavo would go Shell, Shiesty would go Shell, Scraps, everyone would Shell, innit? Everyone would Shell, innit? Yeah, some of the Grimax we had were massive, or oh, massive now, Wiley, Kano, Big Nasty was on Freeze FM at one point. Um, obviously there was Johnny Cash to start with, he was pushing it. Big time. Everyone in West London that I knew called it Sublo because we're in West and them East guys, they weren't respecting us. So we were like, well, why are we going to call it Grime? Because you want to call it Grime. We're going to call it Sublo because Johnny Cash has called it Sublo. West London was a bit underrated, I think. Yeah, it was. Uh, a lot, uh, uh, majorly underrated. West London is an amazing place. The thing is, is that you got, if you mix East, West, North, South, you're going to get a better vibe than just East or just North or just, so. I always knew to, 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 I lived in different parts of it, so I knew to mix that up and connect the people from everywhere. Now I'm the guy, I'm the bridge. Prima, I'm the four group, before the word grind. I am the bridge, yeah? Garage, there's me, I come into the garage scene. I bridged it to when, the, to, to when they called it, to, to, the, to the name the music grind. Freezer Friend played a, a very important role in the grime scene, especially. But our radio station was like catering for our side of town and it, and it was in our world. And then later on when Grime did pop off, the E-Shoots come over to our thing to get their voice heard over this side because they clocked. We had a set with Nasty Crew, so it was like Kano, D-Double, um, Sharky, NJ, Mac-10. And that was one of the first times like they'd ever played in West. And like everyone was coming up to me like that was sick because not many people have heard them before. So that was like the first time that they'd had exposure. I mean, there was a lot of exposure because the station was big. Yeah, when Kano was there, um, well, Nasty Crew, I'd say Nasty Crew, when they came and that, and like, that was quite a big deal because it was like, there was always tapes floating around with these guys and that. But now to hear them on the radio station in our ends and then barring and stuff like that, that was like a, that was like a, a big moment. I came with Nasty Crew. Oh, I think Sharky, Double, Mac 10, the a few different people there. I think Mucky Wolfpack was in there. I've spoken to my cousin, my cousin's like, right, I want to come to West, I want to do a show, yeah? Um, look, I'm going to play this MC down the phone, storming, yeah? He's played this guy down the storm, storming down the phone. I'm like, oh my God, this is, what, is he nasty, yeah? He's like, yeah. But yeah, then we brought storming in and it, it took off. And it took off, I think, a lot to do with 
<laughs> the attitude of the DJ, um, the fact that Sharky was so lyrical at that time and Storming was just a hype master. He's been that from then till now. So I, I, I had my sub thing, and we had the Wiley calling this thing Esky, so we've come, we've come with our own sound, deliberately saying we're not making Garage because you, you hate us, so we're going to you know, do our own thing. But one extra call it Grime, and that's what I fused the Wiley sound, my sound, and all the sort of new generation sound under one umbrella. Uh, yeah? On the first time on Freeze, when I was on with Black Ops, we used to, you know, used to bump into probably some of the Roll Deep people who were big at the time, like Wiley and stuff, used to see them sometimes. What was made first, Wiley's Eskimo, or Johnny Cash's War, which one come first? I think Johnny Cash War is definitely in there for first gram tune, first official gram tune. I, don't know, I, I, I didn't want to be pigeonholed. I said to him, when they pigeonhole music, that means they can lock it off. If they pigeonhole your music here, that means, oh, we don't want to hear gram music here in the West End clubs, then we're going to get shut down. So I said, don't pigeonhole ourselves. Yeah, that, was my, that was my main thing. If you want to pigeonhole something, then they can control it. The birth of gram kind of grew differently and then it became the internet era. So the birth of Grime came with the birth of the internet video era. I loved Grime. Like, I loved Garage and I loved Grime. But there was something about Grime where I was like, I just was more fascinated at watching them doing it as opposed to me doing it. And I don't know why. Most people would be inspired to just want to grab the mic and do what not. But I just, I just remember seeing Dizzy Rascal and just thinking, or even just watching Wiley and just thinking, nah, like, these men are just too sick. Like, they're just too sick. And I just would preferred watching them. So, I was playing hip hop, playing R&B, but watching these guys and then having my, my set on Freezer FM and shit. But all I know is I saw artists go from nobody really knew them to grown, huge artists. And Freeze was definitely a part of that culture, 100%. And this was before we knew what that thing was. Wiley had a song called, what'd you call it? He brought the whole of the UK underground scene to Watford. Literally brought them all to Watford via Freeze FM. You know, I did pirate radio before Freeze, but Freeze, I feel like them lot, Ricky and Ingrid in particular, took a liking to me and they had events going on um, in Watford and all over the place. Watford was live. I was working for Ricky and Ingrid before they took over uh, Freeze FM, I was doing like, they were running promotions all around the area and stuff. So I was really DJing for them. Whenever Freeze FM put on a rave, it was absolutely jam packed. If Freeze FM were putting on a rave, you knew it was gonna be a success. And suddenly the station I'm on is, is running all of these nights, all different, you know, from strip clubs to garage raves to just normal kind of, as they call it, urban nights and R&B and all that. So I had regular bookies in Watford. Freeze FM days would became the takeover of Watford. Do you get me? Like Watford was a quiet little town where they had a few little discos on. Any event we pushed and promoted, it'd be rammed. But I remember, I remember like, I remember Heartless Crew versus Persia Go at Watford. Do you remember that? That was crazy. That was absolutely. If you had that on tape, like that that going around on tape was just like gold dust. Persia Go Heartless. Yeah. That was the first war. Like, they had it, like, and obviously Heartless tried a, a little sneaky thing, sneak attack on, on Page Go in, um, was it Watford? I think it was. Watford, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I've told this story before, not many people probably remember it, but was, it was like D double E and Flirt D. I couldn't see them both. I could just hear, it was like, it was like a semi-war, but it was a back to back and they was going back to back and it was just for like a split moment to back and forth and it was, it was, it was so sick. So while I'm now playing music at Freezer FM, they were doing area nightclub in Watford and they asked me to come and do um, the beginning, like the warm up set there. And I never had a car, I never had anything like that. Yeah, I wasn't driving at the time. So I managed to get a bit of money and I would like get a cab from my house to Watford, yeah? And then a cab from Watford home. Yeah, but this is how it worked out for me. So I would say like the cab was 20 pounds to get to Watford and it was 25 pounds to get back. I was getting 
maybe 30 quid. So it was at a loss. <laughs> like the little envelopes, and they were about that thing. They weren't very big. <laughs> Mix it up, they ran Watford. They, they had every club under lockdown. They, they, they knew what they were doing, the events. They were ram jam. They basically ran Watford. Now, for me, I played in Watford, being a garage MC, you know, those clubs, I think it was O'Shawn at one stage and a Destiny, and all of these different clubs. I was getting garage bookies in those clubs, so I knew Watford, I loved Watford. Watford was like walking out to the shipping iron Napa in the summer, I'll be serious with you, or Cavos. It was a jam, girls everywhere, like, like crazy. Watford was like Ibiza. It, it, was, it was like Ibiza, it was like, you, you couldn't move. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It was, the whole strip got taken over with garage, grime, um, R&B and hip hop and all that, and it just, Watford turned urban. I was DJing all over Watford, like Bar Naz, area, Candy Club. It was like, that was the place, the spot to go in Watford was Candy Club, if you know it. And then they had like some strip clubs. I even done a few sets playing R&B and hip hop in, in their strip clubs for them. Yeah, they, they, had, they had Watford, they had the monopoly on Watford, definitely. You'd have Freeze FM, that's where all the MCs and DJs come to, to perform. Then, off the back of Freezer FM, the DJs and MCs on Freezer FM would have to promote the dances that he's running. So you'd have posters up in the in the place that are big up, big up the dances they're coming up this Saturday or whatever. People go to the dances, the money comes into the till. That money from the till then continues to fund the radio station. They were filling out raves, big raves, and you know, then obviously Eskimo dances and things like that were done in conjunction with like Ricky and Freeze FM and so on and so. The first rave we got booked for, I've still got the flyer to this day. Um, it was an area nightclub. Yeah. Uh, we flopped still, I can't even lie. <laughs> uh, the rave was called Before. I was quite fortunate in the sense that I played at quite a few of the events. Um, being a multi-genre DJ, um, I could dip in and out of the different events that were going on. Um, things like Eskimo dance with the mob um, over to things like before um, where I just do like a classic vocal garage set um, so I was quite blessed in that sense that I did get a lot of bookings uh, from Freeze. They were the biggest thing out there, Watford. It's the events and Watford they, they killed it it was like even music for you music for you was like a music festival like wireless. They've they done the, the first festival I ever DJ that in Watford um, that, that festival they done where they, they took every club in Watford and you just go for different genres all around Watford like it was like different no one had ever done that before and it was a big thing like there was fun fair rides there I think you had EZ you had Wiley there you had everyone because later on down the line when Graham was really popping like in my opinion Freeze FM even though it represented West and Northwest I feel like Freeze had a massive impact on Eskimo dance being a thing. So Eskimo dance had come to, to area in Watford. The real Eskimo dance that we started off, that was like a Northwest London idea. Obviously it got to Watford. Good idea. The, 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 the rebrand, when it went to O2, not such a good idea. But um, going back to the Freeze FM days, they would, they would do Eskimo dance. And I think like for me, that was a time where I was seeing a lot of the people that were on, on Freeze and also on the other radio stations that these guys were from East and whatnot, going to Eskimo dance and, and doing their thing. And that was a massive, I feel like that was a massive moment within grime culture, like seriously, that like area nightclub, area nightclub, Eskimo dance. Like that was, yo, if you weren't getting there early, you weren't even getting in. It was like that. If you weren't getting there early, you weren't getting in. You know, the magnitude of when Flirting would get a reload was next level. Um, Eskimo dance, like being there, mad. Uh, so I would go to like a few things and then Kind of later on, I got to play. When it, I'd say when it kind of started to quieten down a bit, um, I kind of 
was in the mix, obviously, as a result of being on station and, you know, um, you know, being real cool with Alison because Alison was, you know, the best. And obviously me and Ingrid, out to Ingrid, and obviously big shouts to Rick. Ricky and Ingrid? Ricky and Ingrid, yeah. Ricky and Ingrid. Did anyone not have fallen out with those guys? <laughs> Ricky and Ingrid. Woo! You know, you don't need to ask who like Ricky and Ingrid are from a line you might hear in a Skepta track. But don't get it twisted, I'm still a big kid. Might pull up in the whip with the window tinted. Bags full of cash like Ricky and Ingrid. Got bad beats that I make it clap for me. Got Ricky was like a gentleman, like a gangster and a gentleman. Coming with his long black trench coat. He used to always wear some long coat, yeah? I don't know why, but <laughs> anyway. This is before I properly knew him. So he, he had that certain aura about him. You know, like when you walk past him or you talk to him, you know, he could make you feel small sometimes. He could talk to you in a certain way and you'd be like, rah, all right, Ricky. But it was Ingrid now. And, that's, and I know Ingrid. Like, Ingrid's on my social media. I speak to her. Obviously, you know, I've done bookings for them years later after I left Freeze FM. And I have spoken to Ingrid. And I've always said to Ingrid, Ingrid, you should scare me, man. There were times where I would be booked in Candy Club two minutes late. I'd walk in, Ingrid would give me one look. Why are you late? I'd be like, Ingrid, you know what she like, Don't want to hear it. She's like, I remember why she was talking to me about money and that she would say to me, if I cut your wages, would that be appropriate? Or, I was like, then there was times I'd be on the stage, club is packed, I'm spitting, I'm going hard, everyone's going mad. Ingrid would walk over and say, get off the stage now, Ricky wants to see you. So I'd be like, what now? Or after the set, she goes, now. So I'd go in there, there's no MC now. The club's going mad, no MC, just a DJ. I'm walking through the crowd to go to the office, Ricky's there. You couldn't really um, misbehave down there though. Like, like you couldn't really um, be naughty like you could at other stations because you don't either have Ricky on your case or even worse, Ingrid. So yeah, <laughs> no one wanted that smoke. So, sometimes I was late, or a couple of times I didn't turn up or whatever, maybe just as a misunderstanding or something like that, but people were getting sacked like flies on that station if you, if you didn't show it the respect that it deserved. And I respected it, but you know, I could have easily have found myself being sacked, but I feel like they just maybe saw something in me at the time and I got on really well with them that, you know, I got away with a few bits and pieces, but I loved it and I loved it so bad. I love Ingrid though, to be fair. Ring Ingrid always made sure I got paid in the end. Used to do rates for Ingrid. Wait for thin envelope with 80 quids in. Ingrid come and then, um, Ingrid must have come and said, oh, you can't smoke in there. So I was like, oh shit, sorry. So I put it out. So anyway, I'm doing my thing. 10 minutes later, Ricky comes storming in. You can't smoke weed in there. Stop the music. And that was it. I'm not going to say no more on that situation. <laughs> Ricky and Ingrid's ringing down the phone, ringing down the phone. Pick up the phone, sending text messages. Pick up the phone. The phone line is blowing up. Everyone's going nuts, yeah, for me and Storm in the Mac 10. Set is going mad. And Oscar backed her back. Make sure you plug this. Make sure you plug that. Plug this, plug that. We're doing this, Ray. Plug this. Ringing up. Hello, can you plug my Ray? Yeah, yeah, of course, mate. Yeah, yeah, no worries, bro. It was non stop. It was just all about plugging, plugging, plugging. Yeah, you've got to read all them adverts out. What? All 15? Yes, Scratchy. All right, cool. They come right, that's it, you're getting fined, rah, 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 you're banned. They banned me for, for two weeks, yeah? Like, everyone's doing what they're doing. doing. I'm not on the station, but the buzz is mad. Everyone's talking about Nasty Coon, Nasty Jack. Plug out party, plug out party. Plug Candy Club, plug, plug Barnaz, plug Area Watford. They're like, no, you can't do this, ra ta ta. You're not allowed to do this. I don't want this music on the station, NJ. Ra ta ta ta. I said, you know what? I can't stand you people, yeah? My involvement with Freeze and Mix It Up, it was a love and hate relationship because me and Ricky were like chalk and cheese. The moment they let me back on, I've, I've called Crazy Titch, bloody uh, Mac 10. Basically, Nasty Jack has brought us down to Freeze FM. And on Freezer FM, I mean, you had some grime guys there like Musical Mob, um, Rug Rat, and them guys. But everyone's come down. I can't even remember who's got that. It's a bombardment. Furthermore, yeah, it, it was a Musical Mob set. It was just a nut. It was a nut. Every MC was just there, and it was a crackers thing, yeah. The door got barricaded. Yeah, phone in. NJ, da da da. Anyway, yeah, I've got suspended again. I'm the black sheep of the industry. Black sheep, because I'm just too gutter. 
But then, I remember Rick said to me, yeah, could you come down to um, area early? And I'm like, for what? Because I need you guys to hand out some flyers. I was like, what? The, the, what, the flyer that I'm on? <laughs> He's like, yeah. We used to, we used to get fl flyer deliveries and I'd just be looking at these flyers and my name's already on it. Like, Ricky would just be like, oh yeah, you're doing like room two, old school jungle, whatever, with, with pleasure. The other man was handing out flyers for free. And that was their, they was on that. I weren't on that. The Freeze was a good station. Ricky and Ingrid did a lot of big things for the grime scene in terms of entertainment. Freezer for meetings. Who remembers them? You'd have everyone in a room and you know hella smoke's happening. Hella smoke. Because as soon as Ricky goes, right, um, any, any questions? Just you might as well just lower your seat and just wait. Because someone's going to go, yeah, um, well, I just want to be honest, Ricky. I've been on the station for nine months and I'm still doing a two to four. Ricky and Ingrid and Alison are very important people because um, they do business. When a lot of us younger, we were wrangling. We never wasn't doing business. We was fucking seeing what could happen. They knew what could happen if you do business. So they, they actually taught me business at the same time. They, they helped me to learn that business can also be a bit cutthroat. Well, I'm sure everybody will mention their, their falling ins and outs with those guys, but I'll still pick them up, you know, 100%, because you've got to take on board what they did behind the scenes and what they helped to achieve. When I raise my trigger finger. The one thing that made it pirate, though, and the one thing that was sick about pirate radio, whether we all knew it or not, was the risk that we was taking in going to a place to play music or to spit bars. Cause it was illegal. It was illegal. There was people that were going to the radio and DTI would turn up and they was taking your shit. You know what I mean? That happened to a couple of people. They were at radio and DTI turned up and they took their music. They took all their records or whatever. So there was the risk element of it. We had the, we had the authorities, we had the, the police and the DTI and Ofcom trying to stop us, trying to stop Pirate Radio. And their main reason for trying to stop Pirate Radio was because they felt like it was causing crime. And I would say, well, I think Pirate Radio is preventing crime. Uh, DTI, which are the people that get a legal radio station, they're like radio police, yeah? They're kicking off everyone's doors, you can get jail sentences. But I was always told they take the decks, they take the... They just rip everything out and take it. You'd always hear like, yeah, it's DTI, they come in, they'll, uh, they're gonna take your records. I thought, nah, man, no one's taking my records. Do you know what I mean? They come in, man, they'll just take him. I was like, you'd be like this listening, like, who's that, who's that, who's that? Like, all the time. I remember it got raided. Oh, yeah, 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 it got raided. And I think DTI went there when John was playing and I think they, because there was always like rumours about, oh, they take all your records and all that. Our studio was in the basement of his shop and when I'd arrived to do my show, the guys were still in the shop upstairs. So I've gone down, cracked on with the show as you do. 30, 45 minutes later, I can hear all this banging noise from upstairs. And it went off and I'm trying to ring John and John won't answer it. So I was like, no, that's not good thinking it's just the guys in the shop, not paying any attention. And then uh, the studio door was ajar a bit and I can see um, some guys walking down the stairs wearing a uniform, no badges, but just a, a uniform. When we got at the top of the stairs, there was bare feds. I was like, no. Got the balls to drive up and saw the door and saw the police. And when we went there, there was about 20 riot police waiting for us up in the, uh, the lift shaft area. Um, and we basically got arrested for it, you know? Yeah, they questioned us. It was two policemen. There's probably about five of us in there. Um, and they went around the room and they were like asking us <laughs> each other's names. And of course, nobody knows anyone's surnames and no one really knows anyone's real names on radio. So yeah, it was quite funny. I'm on, I'm on private radio station. I'm there and them times they're Ofcom, which, you know, you know Ofcom, they're locking down every station and it was like a big thing Ofcom. I'm there playing records, next minute, bang on the air. <laughs> Friends coming to the station. And listen, you was like, a man used to go jail, not me, not going to jail for radio, but I could have, because I've been up there putting up the ribs with the man then. So I get a call from Kanga. Kanga's like, oh, if you wait for me, we'll go to the block. You know they're downstairs? I was like, what? What do you mean they're downstairs? Two minutes later, we get a knock on the latch. We're like, who's knocking on the latch? And then it's like, off come, please. We're like, oh shit, what are we going to do? You see the downstairs, I was like, I've got, I've got my head in a hole. How do I know they're downstairs? And then um, 
me and Kang are hiding on the roof. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to climb down the tower and on the side of the block. But I have to. You need to get out of there quick. They're coming. I've gone, ah. Oh. The police knocked on the door. And as they open, I remember Lee Tech storming through the stud, like into the studio part to pull the cables out because the MCs were saying it was Freeze FM. And I've run. And as I've got down the first floor, uh, the police have come through the top door. So there's eight stairs to each like landing. I'm doing one landing at a time that a police are following me. And then one of the police just jumped on me and caught me. You're under arrest, Ofcom police. And uh, yeah, they took us to the police station, interviewed us. I denied it. I said, um, I'm not DJ Elski. I've just come along with Kanga because uh, I've got nothing else to do. And his, his plan was shut them up, shut them up, pull the mics out. We know you're DJ Elski. I said, I'm not, I'm not DJ Elski. Next minute, they pulled out a folder with pictures of me in a Ministry of Sound, the baby box, mixing like this. Like, I'm like, ah, oh, right, interview terminated. I want to speak to my solicitor. Then got arrested, sat in the police station, and then it came to the interview room, and they pulled out a big folder, not just on me, but actually on Freeze FM of all the times, that, the recorded times they've taken us off. I mean, we went to court, and at the time, a fair bit of money, it was £650 fine. And obviously banned from doing it again, you know? And they said to me, look, they give me a, they took, give me a £2,000 fine, and they said to me, if you go on a radio station again, you're going six months jail. So from that day on, and they went back on the radio. So that one there, that was the first time that I actually got caught. It ended up being a conviction for Freeze FM. It got to the point where Freeze just got a bit too big for its boots with Freeze not on them. Ofcom weren't having it. They was like, look, you're taking the mic now. They class it as organised crime. If you've already got a pirate radio station in London, you can't have Freeze not on them up in Nottingham. When it came to taking Freeze off, we always prided on coming back within a few hours. So towards the end, we were getting hit at 10 o'clock. I'd phone Elski, he'd come and help me, he was the right hand man, he was there with me. We bit the block by 11, give it another hour, I'll be back on again by half 12. And then sometimes, it'd be off again by two. I'd be like, right, that's when I started realising there's, there's some issues here. Something's not right, how can you get hit twice in a day? Um, and when Freeze did die, you know, we then came to a kind of almost like, what do we do now? You know, what do we do now? It was great to be part of that and be on them, especially for, like we were talking about the social media, so you didn't really have that. So when you used to see people out on, um, on events and stuff like that, being from that area, it was good because that was the basis. That was, you know what I mean? That's your area, so it's good to be on the station. I remember a time listening to the radio station and Bashi had a beef with like Wiley and all of them, yeah. And he went to the radio station, he went to Freeze FM and he went ham. But in those in those days, when you said when you said something, that's it. It's yeah. odd. It's not I'm not saying it because it's, it sounds good. Yeah. I'm saying it because when I see you, yeah, yeah. it's odd. He was gonna hammer bear people and I think he was gonna hammer Marcy Phonics and Hyperfen, I think. I could be wrong at that. But I heard that people had turned up to the radio station while he was in there. Let me say this. Me and Bashi now, we're friends, that's my guy. But back then, that was a, it was a different time. We was all young and we was all hungry, do you know what I mean? And it, it was just one of, those, it was one of those things. But back in the day, yeah, we did have our little run-ins and that, and it was good for the fans and it was good and it, was, it made you improve. You know, we had our moments at Eskimo Dance where he caught me off guard the first time. I got him back on the next one uh, and then it went to the radio. So he'd be saying what he's saying at the radio. We'd turn up at the radio, we'd be saying what we're saying. And it just became, it was always like that, but that was what made it, that, that's our history. This is, this is, this was fun. And you had people like Bashi from Northwest, that's in a crew from East, and then they're coming down to the radio station. So when like East Connection turned into special delivery, they really got their stripes in freeze rather than East, you know what I mean? One of the big, big things about Pirate Radio and Freeze FM was the fact that it, it did give the kids a chance. It gave the kids something to aim for, something to keep them away from a life of crime. Yeah, we, we, we got voted, uh, Freeze FM got voted three years in a row at the, uh, the People's Choice Awards, which yeah. I was quite lucky enough to 
to play it to one, play at the yeah. uh, People's Choice Awards. I played in the garage arena. Uh, being on a station that holds like three trophies three years in a row, it's a big, big thing. It is a big yeah, thing. Yeah. You cannot knock that because it's. it's so when it's, I was there playing yeah. at Sidewinder for the, yeah, the, Sidewinder, the, the yeah. UK Garage Awards, I was also representing and Freeze. Freeze. At the end of the day, Freeze was an amazing station. You know, I had amazing times there. As I say, my Sunday was left for me my show. There was no vibe like Pirate Radio, getting down with the listeners, do you know what I'm saying? Like, you had them locked. You had people phoning up religiously every week, texting, da da da, do you know what I mean? And it was crazy, because you'd have thousands of phone calls throughout the set, but you'd always have, you'd always know who your regulars were. And you know what as well, yeah, was funny about Freeze is that like, and I guess I have a pirate radio station, but Freeze was a place where I had definitely had a couple of blind dates. Had definitely had a couple of blind dates. Yo, the phone line rings, it's 651, and 651 keeps ringing all the time. And like, you're chatting to 651 on the phone and whatnot, but remember, you don't have social media, so you don't know what they look like, but the voice sounds Chris, yeah? And then, boom. You end up just saying, yeah, take my number. And you're talking on the phone for ages and that. And then like, you end up going and meeting them and they look nothing like what they sound on the phone. Nothing. I realized that I probably dedicated maybe 15 years, a bit more maybe, to being on pirate radio shows. But there were other platforms now that I could use. I didn't need to be on Pirate Radio. And Pirate Radio will never have the same pool when, you know, your YouTubes are there. There are different ways of connecting with your fans. Yeah, man, it was a good time. It was, it was, yeah, I miss, I've missed those days, yeah. I look back with fond memories of all that whole time of, you know, clucking for tunes and getting your tunes, cutting dubs. You know, I remember every single show I did on there, the phone line, it just would not stop. Sometimes I'd hold the studio phone in my hands and it would be vibrating and bleeping with all the, the text messages and missed calls like every second and, and people are shouting you out and like your people are texting in like for shouts and stuff like that it's um yeah it's a big thing it's a, like it's, it's a shame that we don't have it anymore we don't we don't have the um the innocence of pirate radio anymore it's like if if you gave me if you were a producer you could ring me on a on a thursday mark i've got a I've got a tune for you this week. I couldn't play it on CD. I had to go and cut it on dub play. So, I, the, the MP3s didn't exist, as in like, to play them. When the phone line used to go, yeah. <laughs> Ooh. So back then it was just like, a, it was a mobile, and you gave out the number, and people used to text in their shouts. And it wasn't like, you didn't know anyone's names or anything, so it was just like the number in it. So it'll be like 616, Ultra 812, and then if that was enough, you just knew that was your personal shout, innit? That gives you your boost, you felt good, innit? You communicated and we communicated back. And that just used to happen on the reg. It used to be I would get a hands free kit for the Nokia, because we didn't have iPhones or Blackberries and all that. This was just before that time. So I'd get the um, hands free set and I'd adapt it so I could plug it into the, to the back of the mixer and the phone so uh, we could do live calls and that was mad. Like, yeah, that was funny times. That was crazy. You'd drop a tune that everyone loved and you'd get 100 missed calls within a minute. You know, and you'd say, well, I'm only rewinding it if I get 100 missed calls within two minutes, three minutes. And yeah, the phone would blow up. It was Seriously, like, there was there was points where the phone would just literally buzz melt. in your it, hand. Buzz in your buzz. hand. You couldn't you couldn't do anything. It's, you couldn't push a button. It was just buzzing. You say, give me ten for the next one before it even come. You got twenty. The phone line at one point being so mad. Um, Origin it was. He was he was doing my mic and that at the time. And I remember him getting the phone and, and basically throwing it down on the chair because it just wouldn't stop buzzing. The last three digits is always, yeah, big up the 626, yeah, big up this one, big up 727, and all that, it was non-stop. Texting, 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 miss call, miss call, miss call. The phone line used to bang on live call. To be honest with you, I was quite fortunate. Enough times when I was on the radio, my phone line was banging. And my phone line would pop. I just love the buzz of pirate radio. You go there, you've got a phone line, you're getting like 100 to 200 missed calls just for a tune to get rewound. and. Um, it was just mad times, like, you'd leave the studio with 300 or 400 texts. But it was, 
it was interaction with people, not like over internet. It was actual people calling up and letting you know how they felt about the content you were putting out there. You know, you are not going to find a station now where you can say, okay, for Garage, you had Hyperactive, you had Sharky P, you had your Spinny Bees, you know, your Ashley J's, your Martin Lana's, your Chunky Sunships. And then for Grime, on the same roster, you've got your Wileys, you've got your Skeptors, you've got your Flirt of D's and, you know, SLK's and Musical Mobs and Nasty Crews and, like, let's be real, there's no station where you've had that kind of mix. You know, people like Chucky, all of those guys who are, who are kings in their own game were on that station. So, so yeah, Freeze FM got, had it locked and they had it locked from the fact that they had crazy raves every single week. You know, we're not talking about that one big rave at the end of the month for in, we're talking every week they had raves all over uh, Hertfordshire and, and, and all over West London, North London, North West London. You can't, I can't think of a station that was doing it like that really. The game's completely changed now. Um, do we need pirate radio now? No, but do we need pirate radio spirit and certain setups like pirate radio? Yes, you know, it's different. People, you know, people can switch a button on their phone now and they can listen to something in HD and whatever. Whereas the cool thing about pirate radio, it sounds mad, but the cool thing about pirate radio back in the day is that it was a bit gritty. It was a bit underground, like it was a bit, do you feel me? Like it was a bit like, you couldn't always hear everything and that made it more interesting. You can't have pirate radio today because the internet is in full force and basically I don't think it would work because the way technology and students and Apple and everyone are going forward, pirate radio is a bit too far back. But what you can do is you can stream via YouTube, via Twitch, via whatever and you can come out like internet radio, I think. It, but not like the way it was then, I don't think we can do that again. I don't even know if anyone can get on the tower blocks anymore, you know what I mean? Freeze FM was like, I honed in my craft there. I learned, you know what I mean? Learned so many aspects of the music industry and DJing from being on that station, uh, it really helped. It was a nice transition. Freeze FM was a nice transition for me going from just an MC on radio to actually making songs and putting them out there. Freeze FM in particular was so important to, I think the people that are still doing music now that were on the station for a significant amount of time. Yeah, I'm very grateful that like, I had my little moment on there. And more so that those guys that were running the radio station, you know, spent like, they, they really checked for me. Boy, Freeze FM days, man. Freeze FM was, that was my outlet, man. It was, that was where we went to release. That was where we tried new bars. That was where we experimented with new music, new beats. It was definitely a UK garage sound. Well, obviously grime as well. You can't forget that obviously from garage came grime and it develops in blue and you've got a whole heap of grime artists that were on Freeze FM as well. So big them and up same time as well. And it was all about Freeze FM's pockets and they saw the young guys and thought, yeah, let's find a way to exploit them. And that little cheeky bugger NJ, he talks too much. Let's etch him out, get the guys from East in there before it was grime and say that we had part of grime. Listen, when me and NJ we were kids, we were terrorists. We were the cousins that no one wanted to put together. Who, who was kind of the same as he was when he was younger, just like me. So, like, yeah, <laughs> I will always remember that. I was looking down from the decks and this man, I think he had half of it plaited hair, but the rest was just, ah, he looked nuts. And he was on his own on that stage, just having it. I didn't really get it because he didn't sound like an East MC. And that's what I was used to. You know what I mean? He had his own net style, but, he stood out for me and then he turned out, he's my cousin, so. Freezer FM for me, I've had many experiences at Freezer FM. Freezer FM, um, my cousin's Nasty Jack, first of all, he's from West London, so the way it worked with pirate radio stations in London, it was like each area would have their main station. We had in East London, like, sort of deja vu. And, and in them days there, we wouldn't need to know if the tune was liked by thousands of people. You're in the rave, you hear the tune, your body reacts to it. Now, you, this, this, is how, this, this is how today's kids are. Oh, how many likes it got? How many followers has it got? Oh, do they like it? Then I like it if they like it. Pirate radio and the music of that time gave the kids, like myself and like most of the, uh, the MCs who've gone on to have good careers, it gave 
all of us something to aim for. And you'll never get that group of people come together and just do their thing and everyone got on. Um, but that's what that's what Freeze FM was like, you know. You went down there, everyone was, we was a family. Well, even, even now to this day, I still get people coming up to me saying, what, you're the Johnny M that used to play on Freeze FM <laughs> back in the day? Like a lot of people from Freeze FM are still doing music now and still making money or have done, have made a nice bit of dough in their life through doing music and we all started out on Freeze really, Freeze FM, West London. They wouldn't be in the position that they're now if it wasn't for Pirate Station because it was a stepping stone. Yeah. It was a stepping stone for us to, to, yeah. to elaborate and express our music. Freeze FM, Freeze FM to me was, I'd say, a big part of me. And a lot, I put a lot of time into Freeze and Freeze put a lot of time into me. Do you know what, I think Pirate Radio gave you the energy you needed to make it in that, and not everyone made it. And I don't mean made it famous, I mean, man of going radio and not touching the mic because you're shook. But Freeze had a, a hell of a long run. Like, let's be real, like, Freeze was probably the state, the one station that I was on, out of all the stations that I've been on for a long time, that had the lineups. But it was, it was special to be part of that. It felt special to be part of that. And it felt special now to still have that in my life. Right, Pirate Radio was life when you was growing up. So yeah, that's, that's, that's my story, man. Like my story, I've ended up in, in UK drill somehow. I don't know how, but that's, that's what's happened. And obviously looking back at it now, like I knew Freeze was like the biggest station, but it's only when you look back, you realise. There weren't many drum and bass or jungle DJs. So it sort of uh, give it a bit more of a spectrum, I suppose. The Pirate Radio Station played an important part in the music scene and bringing people together. That's why we say Pirate Radio was a community thing. Pirate Radio was, Pirate Radio was just pivotal to like, and so important to communities all over like London and outside. Like I've, even like if you had Pirate Radio in Birmingham, Manchester, all the inner cities and that, that was what you listen. Whether you listen to grime, um, hip hop, R and B, reggae, roots, whatever, yeah. Like, everyone was listening to Pirate Radio. Everyone had their favourite pirate, pirate station. Pirate Radio is the reason I'm here, and it's the reason why people say, uh, Esky Boy is the reason why everybody's here. So that is the Pirate Radio in me. Anywhere in London, 927, and that was it. I, I didn't, I don't think I had another garage station on my presets for the whole time Free The Film was on the air, and that's the truth. I think we just became news reporters for the, for the streets and for the, and for the industry. It was Pirate Radio. Don't ever get it twisted. Pirate Radio Station was everything for the music scene because what started underground always went commercial. We all know that, innit? It was good times, man, working with your idols and people walking into the office, like famous people, while he's there. He's like, Elski, what's going on? And I was like, yes, Wiley, or you see Dizzy, or you see um, Skepta, and it's like, do you know what? All right, I'll put it like this for the, for, for the documentary. When I think of Freeze FM, I think of the vinyl records, I think of um, Eskimo Dance, I think of Northwest and West Grime having a voice finally. That's a bit later, yeah? And then I think of you lot, early garage days, Miracle Men, um, Fatal Attraction, Flavor G and Chig, like, that's what I think of, isn't it, straight away? But now you can look back at things, especially some of them now that become pretty big artists, where you could say, well, wow, they used to be on Freeze. Listen, it's love, man. These, you see these, these three brothers right here? The love for them is, is, is I, can't even, I can't even put it into words, man. I'm, I'm just appreciative that I had that time. <clears throat> we had that experience and like we're still brothers now man so we might not be fate and attraction on the mic but we're still fate and attraction brothers for life um i think pleasure got me in um who again was another pivotal part of, of freeze to be fair he was if it wasn't for him that that station wouldn't have been up you know the, you never replace the crackle of that dial when you're tuning in like trying to get the frequency People will never understand, never ever. Anyone that's under 30 will never understand about in the summer, walking down the road and every single car is playing that pirate radio station that everyone's listening to. And that's what it was like. You'd hear garage coming out of all the shops. You'd hear 
garage coming out of all the cars and it would all be the same radio station playing. Oh man, pirate radio was the trenches. It was so important. That's like, you know, that's where you learn your craft. That is, that is it, you know. Freeze FM was a massive part of my life for a long time. Well, it felt like a long time. But then when you look back in the space of years, like 99 to 2001, so much happened in that time. Like it had all the pirate material, but it was just on all the time and it was consistent. And obviously it was really well run as well. Like it was, it was run much better than like any other station. Piper and Gusto already had the foundations. Ashley J, we had the foundations there. And we was already running events. But that, that core of people from the very start they're the foundation, mate. They're the ones that took it, you know, from the very, very start. Do the African guy on the show, and I remember Hype saying, yeah, is this something about Bunti or 10K Bunti? He said, yeah, let's go with it. And then we was practicing on the train from south all the way up to the station. So I was practicing. I was just saying anything, not whatever. Oh, this is, this is a madness. So I'd go like, hey, London town, this is a Kenke Bunte, and you are listening to a Freeze FM. That's all I want to say, really. Like, there was other people, like, big up um, Marvel crew, big up the people that didn't make it, the Fallen Soldiers, them. Not that they were fallen and died or anything, it's just that they just didn't make it in music, but they were hard at the time. Big up um, Marvel crew, big up um, Sudbury Soldiers, big up Renegade Boys. Big up my, my crew, Dynasty, from back in the day, that was like, that was my, my childhood, my youth. Everyone contributed, everyone had different styles. We had Naughty G, Hitman Tigger, Speedy Rex, Diablo, Doody, Wizkid, um, Hyperfen, obviously. Obviously, everyone knows Hype. I mean, I, I remember one time, like, shout out Marcy and that, like, Dynasty crew. They was repping heavy for West. Like, there wasn't really no one. Like, Dynasty, Dynasty Musical Mob was Dynamic M who had bought a couple of youth from West, which was Rugrat and Dizman. But Dynasty crew going hard, Hitman Tigger and then man, Hyper Fen. And it was even exciting to hear them back to back with Roll Deep on Freeze. And uh, you had Odyssey. Oh, we had Odyssey. You had Flavor, Flavor G. G. You had Chick. You know. You had um, KO. KO. You had MC Will. You know what I mean? You had MC H. Yeah, the other names, all the local boys Stony and Fair One, um, Easy P, uh, Links and Matrix. Yeah, London Zoo, yeah, yeah, yeah. My boys, obviously, London Zoo. Um, I forget, because they come on a little bit later. It was like Johnny K um, and Pringle done a show on like a Saturday, and then Jed. I was a member of the Heaven Squad. Light Man, Yardstar. Originally, there was a guy called Nike as well. Um, Devastator was a DJ, Therapy was a DJ, Wicked Wire was a DJ, and Knowledge was a DJ. Then you had Metric. Um, Knuckles was in the original lineup. We're just lucky to be part of it, really. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad I was part of it and got into that circle. So Pirate Radio was big. Freeze FM was big. Send love out to all those that were involved from day one. We're done now. What I do want to do is I want to thank Ricky, Ingrid, Adam. I want to thank the whole team at Freeze FM for, for what they've done for, for London, for the industry, for the scene. And to be honest, a lot of people have made a good living out of DJing and MCing. And I'd say that Freeze, stations like Freeze FM and Ice FM played a massive part in that. Um, so thank you for giving us Freeze FM.